for him. So it's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, start at verse 1 again. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by a gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't forget, nearly all the other Bibles change that word Christ to Lord. Have a look at that. And again, it changes things. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all, that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Note who's sending that. Not the devil. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth. You see what happens when you reject truth? But had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks all way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. See where Calvinist comes in there. But we'll deal with that, God willing, if we get there this evening. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to traditions which we have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Not much comfort there if you're going through the tribulation, is there? Thank God we're not. Now, we're picking up from verse 4. And we, we did a little bit on that last time, didn't we? But we're going to pick up again from there. Um, reading in from verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Showing himself that he is God. Now turn to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 and 37. You see, Daniel spots him immediately. Daniel knows what's coming in the sense here. 36 and 37. And the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself, the king, and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvellous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god for he shall magnify himself above all. You know what? That's a fantastic cross-reference to what we've just read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. This is the Antichrist coming. This is incredible. Now, just like Jesus Christ had a forerunner, so does the Antichrist, the forerunner being John the Baptist. He has a forerunner on earth here. And it is the Pope in the sense of his office. The, the Pope's office is Antichrist. It's always been. The false religion of the Bible is the Roman Catholic religion. It's Antichrist. All Popes are Antichrist. 
and the office of the Pope is Antichrist. Popes claim the title of God the Father. Holy Father, they call themselves. John 17, 11. They call themselves Holy Father, taking God's title. And they allow sinners to bow down and worship them. Isn't that incredible? They allow that to happen. The popes. Who was the so-called first pope? Peter. We went on a tour in Rome once and they told us that the first pope was the Apostle Peter. Interesting that Peter never went to Rome, isn't it? (laughs) But he was meant to be the first pope. But the popes today... The people fall before them, they kiss their feet, they rub the, you know, kiss the ring, kiss the feet. Listen, they allow themselves to be worshipped, they see themselves as God. The so called first Pope, look at Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. This is the first Pope, so called. Verse 25 and 26. And as Peter the first Pope, was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter says, that's the way it should be done. No, he didn't. Peter took him up, saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. Isn't that different to the Popes we have today? And yet they believe that the first Pope was Peter. Ludicrous, isn't it? The Antichrist desires worship. Daniel 11, 36 and 37. We read that, didn't we? He desires worship. And notice also, I I found this interesting. I'm going back to Daniel. And again, I haven't really got time to go into this tonight. Um, Daniel 11, yeah, 36 and 37 again. And to the king, so he's a king, the Antichrist is a king, shall do according to his will... And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvellous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the the god of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any god for he shall magnify himself above all nor the desire of women. Isn't it a strange thing that today the desire of women compared to sodomites today wouldn't surprise me if he turns up as a sodomite. I'm not saying he is, but as a, you know, that, that, that would need some study. Wouldn't surprise me. But he desires worship. And again, what we'd need to do, but because of time we can't tonight, but I think we read it last time, you definitely need to keep in um, context here with Revelation 13. You need to read Revelation 13 in regard to this. So, what will happen is the Antichrist will probably start in Rome and then he will move to Jerusalem. Now, I said 2015 will be significant because we've just, um, again, just um, heard that the Pope, and it was in the American papers, wasn't it, that the Pope now is setting up for the first time in 2015, he's going to Jerusalem to set up his throne in the Dome of the Rock. 2015. You're in it. The Pope's office is the Antichrist. It's very interesting that this is the year that the Pope is going to Jerusalem and setting up his throne in the Dome of the Rock. Something's happening, folks. We are so close to the nearing of the Lord's return, the rapture, it is amazing. But we'll get into that in a little bit. He'll probably start in Rome, then he'll move to Jerusalem. Okay, so who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Revealed in his time. Here it comes. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Most Christians read that as the who? Who? The Holy Spirit. Now, where do they get that from? In verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Can you open up, please, the New King James Bibles that you have in front of you? 
to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 and read that verse in that perverted Bible and tell me what you see. Somebody read it aloud, please. Amit, you there? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now uh, restraineth will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now, in regard to those two he's, have you got a small h or capital H? Capital H. Isn't that interesting? Capital H. Do you know what they've done? They've put deity onto those two he's. And that is incorrect. If you change one letter of the authorised version Bible, you will fall and you will never get the cross-references, you will never understand, and that is why these prophecy people that are big on prophecy, if they're using anything other than an authorised version Bible, they will be shot to bits when it comes to certain details. One of those details is who is letting and will be taken out of the way. If they say it's the Holy Spirit, they are wrong. We'll get into this. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he, in the authorised version Bible, small h, who now letteth, will let until he, small h, will be taken out of the way. Now the word let means to hinder, to stop. Look at Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. Who's ever played tennis? Anybody played tennis? If, you hit, if you're taking a serve and you hit the net, what do they say? What do they call? For, what are they? Let. They call let. You listen to Wimbledon. I thought you lot played tennis. <laughs> I tell you, you can't trust Christians. You know, you hit that net and as soon as it, if it touches it, they say, let. <laughs> You'll remember that now, won't you? And you know what they're talking? They're talking an AV 1611 King James Bible. How mad is that? And that's in Wimbledon. Old Federer. He speaks, he speaks the AV and doesn't even know it. Isaiah 43, 13. Look at that. Yea, before the day was, was I am he. Yeah, sorry, yea. Before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work and who shall let it? Look at Romans 1, 13. Just giving you two illustrations of the word let, to hinder, to stop. Romans 1, 13. Now I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. So it means to let. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The he of verse 7 has been preceded with these scriptural statements. Listen carefully. That man of sin who opposeth and exalteth himself He as God, showing himself that he is God, that he might be revealed in his time. So from verses 3 to 6, that the he of verse 7 has been preceded with those scriptural statements from verse 3 to verse 6. Look at that carefully. The expression taken out of the way is not talking about the Holy Spirit. I was taught that it was all those years, but it isn't. You can't take away the Holy Spirit from space. Let me give you a couple of things here. Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. Verse 24. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Saith the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Psalm 139. Verse 7 and 8. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. The Holy Spirit's in hell there. In heaven and in hell. And it goes on. There's loads of those. 
He could be taken away from a man's body in the Old Testament, as we've said before, because people in the Old Testament, they could lose their salvation. So he can be taken away from a body, Judges 16, 20. Let's just turn there. I've got to do this one-handed, so you're going to have to help me out sometimes. Judges 16, verse 20. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. The Lord had departed. The Spirit wasn't on him or in him, shall we say, any longer. He used to come upon you and then it was, um, he would leave you. So Samson was one that lost, lost it and gained it again. Hence why he's in the Heroes of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Psalm 51 that great psalm, which I hope Latoya can still repeat word for word, and if she can't, we'll test her afterwards. Psalm 51, verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So the Holy Spirit could leave a man in the Old Testament. It cannot you, because you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit doesn't come upon you, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Look at 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. You see, Saul had the Spirit leave him and never gained it again. He lost his salvation. Samson lost his salvation, gained it again, and is in the heroes of the faith. David had the sure mercies of God. And he never, he had eternal security, even in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit is active on this earth in the tribulation. Think about that. In the tribulation. Revelation 11, verse 11. And after three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them, which saw them. So it's not the Holy Spirit leaves with the church. He cannot. He's here during the tribulation. How could he be if he were taken out of the way before it began? He doesn't. God's Holy Spirit is omnipresent. David said he'd be, in, he'd be present even in hell. We said in Psalm 139 verse 7 and 8. Also look at 1 Kings 8. 1 Kings 8 verse 27. 1 Kings 8 Verse 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have builded. He cannot contain him. He doesn't leave with the church. That's an erroneous teaching. The man of sin is the man of sin until some time, at a future time, listen carefully, when he will be revealed in a more complete character. The son of perdition. And we're talking right now, Paul's time, he is present, but not in his final form. He is a type of what is coming, exactly as Joseph and David were types of Christ. The man of sin is a type of the Antichrist. So many Antichrists precede the son of perdition. We read in 1 John 2, 18 about the Antichrist. The Pope, any Pope, is the man of sin who will finally get into Israel's capital, Jerusalem, and pretend that he is God's king, sent to rule Mount Zion, God's holy mountain, Psalm 2. His calling as the true Messiah will be to kill Jews, Daniel 11, verse 32 and 35 to 35. Something, however, holds him back from becoming the son of perdition in this age. Look at verse 6. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The what in verse 6 or something that lets and withholds is is, is referred to as the mystery of iniquity, verse 7. This mystery had to be working in Paul's time before there were any popes. Doth already work, it says in verse 7. But Caesar and Rome were certainly paving the way for the man of sin. Now look at this again carefully and then we'll sum it up. Verse 6. 
And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. That wicked Satan, capital W in verse 8, will not be revealed to mankind until the man of sin is taken out of the way. It's like the forerunner. For it is he who is preventing the mystery of iniquity from fulfilling itself. When Satan is revealed as a man, Isaiah 14, 16, he is the seed of Satan, Genesis 3, 15. So when he comes, he comes with a forerunner, just like John the Baptist. Look at Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Verse 11 and 12. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Isn't it interesting? Talk about Antichrist, two horns like a lamb, the lamb of God, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this person here, the man of sin... That wicked, let's go back, that wicked will not be revealed to mankind until the man of sin is taken out of the way, for it is he who is preventing the mystery of iniquity from fulfilling itself. When Satan is revealed as a man, he is the seed of Satan, so when he comes, he comes with a forerunner, just like John the Baptist. He comes with the Jewish signs and wonders, And he is there to deceive. And that is why, as we read down, let's just read this again from verse 3. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time, the man of sin, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he, the man of sin, who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And that, of course, is talking about the second advent, when he comes. And there's loads of verses on that, but again, because of time, we're not going to go in there. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, and there it is again, look, and signs and lying wonders. Now this is called Jacob's trouble, and therefore it's predominantly Jewish. God is dealing with the Jews, not just the world, but predominantly with the Jews, Jacob's trouble. And so straight away, when we talk about the sign gifts and we go into Jacob's trouble, we see signs and lying wonders straight away taking, coming into effect again. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Now, going back to verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Just got some cross-references there. And um, just run these a second. Isaiah 11. Again, I'm learning, this is a big thing for me as well, so we're learning together. I'm sure there'll be other questions we'll have perhaps at the end. Um, Isaiah 11, verse 4. But with the righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Revelation 2, 16. The Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. These are the reference to that. Revelation 2, 16. 
um, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So it's talking about when the wicked shall be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And again, Ephesians 6.17 talks about the sword. And then Revelation 19, 15 and 21 talks about when Jesus comes back, the sword going before him out of his mouth. And of course, Hebrews 4.12, the two-edged sword. Which again, is significant as we get into um, verse 11 and 12 in a second. So, the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Does that make sense? Can you see that? Okay, and then, um, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. The spirit of his mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And uh, two things, uh, t- two great studies would be here, and again, I haven't got the time to go into the scriptures here, the scriptures in regard to the second advent are incredible and the path, the path of the second advent is amazing. How Jesus Christ, where he goes, the way he comes back is incredible. What he, where he crosses over um, one river, isn't it? And um, he, he drinks from there and he comes back through the eastern gate. It's an incredible study. The eastern gate and, um, you know, you know, even trampling over the Muslim gravestone, riding an Arabian stallion, talk about rubbing salt in the wound, incredible. Um, but it's an amazing study. And the also, another study which I've never done but I'd love to do, is the study of Satan's seed. Satan's seed. If you study that, the seed of Satan, from Genesis 3.15, amazing. And you'll find it comes all the way to Judas Iscariot, who will be not like... Oh, it's going to sound crazy, but it will be like brought back, resurrected, so-called. Judas went to his own place. Judas hasn't been finished with yet. And, you, and again, how Satan sort of like um, possesses him. It's an incredible study. But that's again a deep one that would need some research into that. But very interesting. So getting down, um, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion. Who's sending them strong delusion? God. That they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, because the people rejected and received not the truth, verse 10, God deludes them and gives up on them. Now, you see this in Romans chapter 1. God can give up on a man. That's why you've got to be very, very careful. Look at um, Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. Look at verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Look at verse 28, Romans 1, 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient. God gives them up, God gives them up, God gives them over, because they preferred their sin and they rejected God, and they rejected his word, and they rejected the truth. God gives them up. Do you know, um, uh, the talking about the verse 11, for this cause, God shall send them a strong to the Yeah. Yeah, I believe that is definitely connected to that as well. Yeah, because again, lying signs and wonders is there to deceive. Um, you know, he um, was it Antichrist. Um, he gets healed. You know, he heals himself. He can heal. You know, Satan can heal. He copied. Isn't it amazing? He copied the. Um, even in Janus and Jambres, didn't he? He copied the um, the miracles that were done there. The only one he couldn't copy was the creating the life. He can't create life, but he can distort, he can satanically heal. He will deceive. He will deceive. Because the people rejected and received not the truth, God deludes them and gives them up, um, gives up on them. Ezekiel said this would happen 500 years before Christ was born. Look at this, this is very interesting. Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. Verse 1 to 11. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before them. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, 
These men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of, the, of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of all, of, uh, inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel which separateth himself from me and setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me I the Lord will answer him by myself. And I will set my face against that man and will make him a sign and a proverb and I will cut him off from the midst of my people and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I the Lord have deceived that prophet. Who deceived that prophet? The Lord. And I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. That the house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people and I will be their God, saith the Lord God. God judges the heart and motive. And if you're stubborn and you're rebellious and you, have no, and you have no interest in God or his word, God will punish and he will judge. But if you're a person that is willing to repent and turn to God, God will forgive and he will show mercy. But the trouble is, you see, everybody wants God to be merciful and forgiving and loving. But nobody wants the judgment and the punishment that is coming. Even this week, we had a person um, text D. Um, Dion here, and um, she was saying that um, you're just talking negative all the time. You see, that's what people want. They want people to talk positive, and they want to come to church and have a feel-good factor. What we're trying to do, and you know this, and that's why you're Bible believers, you come here for truth. And two-thirds, think about this, two-thirds of the gospel is negative. Death and burial. Resurrection. Two-thirds of the gospel is negative. You've got to get them lost before you get them saved. And the trouble is, people don't like the way we speak because in this positive world with all this political correctness, people want to, be, want, they want to feel good. And so they come to church and they want to meet and have friends and have coffee time. And this, They don't want to know. But listen, God's judgment is just around the corner. The rapture is going to happen and then hell on earth is going to break loose. Satan and Antichrist, the false prophet, the beast, it's, the whole thing is going to be poured out, God's wrath is going to be poured out, and, and two-thirds of the world is going to die. Seven billion people, work that one out. We preach the truth to warn you of what is to come. You can't mock God. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. God is showing you here, I mean, turn to Jude, I mean, this is an amazing... Um, verse, isn't it? In fact, yeah, and these, these are incredible. Um, to, let me give you this. Jude 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints, this is the second advent, to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. The second advent is coming for punishment of all those that are ungodly and have rejected God and rejected his word. 
You know, some Christians don't even know that these scriptures are in the Bible. Because they're so into love, joy and peace, and the gifts, and signs and wonders, and power... They didn't even know these things are in the scriptures. Look at this, we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're dealing with the end times. We're dealing, listen, we're in 2015. The rapture could happen this year. Probably will. Amazing. I mean, we may have days ahead of us, weeks maybe, you know, let alone months and years. Some Christians think we're going to have years and they're planning years ahead. Look at this in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, sorry, sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished, punished, with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power. Man, you don't mess... (laughs) with the Lord. We're trying to warn people of what is to come. We're trying to say, if you're not a Christian, you're going to go through this hell on earth called the tribulation and you've got to endure to the end to be saved. You won't be, you won't be able to buy or sell unless you take the mark of the beast. And if you take the mark of the beast, that's it, folks. So what we're trying to do is gear you up to what is coming. We're trying to speak the truth in love. <laughs> Who wants to speak negative? I don't get a kick out of speaking negative. I don't get a kick um, of, of talking about hellfire and judgment and the Antichrist coming. Man alive, this world, we're seeing the problems with Islam, let alone the tribulation, what's coming. It's going to be horrendous, a millionfold worse than what you're seeing on the streets now. Fourteen people got killed in that, um, that place in Paris. Two thirds of the world died during the tribulation. Blood, it said the blood, there's going to be so much blood, even at the second advent when God comes and d- delivers Israel and, you know, uh, from all their enemies, that the blood is going to be up to the horse's bridle. You see, we can't understand this either. If the blood is left, you see, everybody likes doing this Hollywood film, we've just seen this, you know, this rapture, Nicolas Cage film, etc., and the rapture happens, and again, you know, it's a little bit of a shock factor to those that perhaps don't know much about this and that. But could you imagine being on that plane when the rapture happens, and every single person that goes, eight pints of blood are left behind? You know what you've done when you've dropped a bottle of milk in your kitchen. One pint. Imagine eight pints of blood being left behind. No wonder people are going to go off their heads... You won't believe the mass hysteria and the chaos that we're, that we're being saved from, out of, from. Thank God. That's why we can comfort with one another with these words, because we're not going through it. Imagine the body of Christ going through the tribulation. Then God's pouring his wrath on his own body. do not make sense. These people are post-tribbers are mad. So, going back to this, we're going to have to bomb through this, nearly done. So verse 11, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. You're damned if you don't believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. People have pleasure in unrighteousness. The sodomites, the pornography, the lust, you know, the sexual music, the innuendo, the the stuff that's on television, they're brainwashing our kids with all this stuff. They have pleasure in unrighteousness. They're going to be damned. They're going to burn in hell forever. Ezekiel, what we just read, knew this would happen 500 years before Christ was born. You see, it's like a two-edged sword. It's accept or reject. It's a two-edged sword. Accept the Lord. It's like this, you know, we said before, when you fall on the stone or the stone falls on you. It's a two-edged sword. The, this book cuts you. It cuts you to, it, it, in, into your heart. It gets there and it convicts you. And you either, so you have the word of God preached to you, you have some um, of the word of God that really penetrates your heart, the gospel is presented to you, and you realise you're a sinner. Now you, that, that sword that has cut you, you can say, right, now I believe. And this is God, what we all did. We believed what we heard and we received the Lord Jesus Christ and got saved. But if we didn't, and we rejected God, that two-edged sword has a second blow. Accept or reject. And it's coming, and it's coming with power and punishment, and when God comes, it says the sword comes out of his mouth. And the picture of the word of God is the sword, the spirit, the sword of the word of God. 
two-edged sword. You fall on Christ, you get saved. If you don't, you reject Christ, Christ will fall on you. Oh, well, you're just preaching hellfire and damnation, you're just trying to scare us. Like one preacher said, I'd rather scare you out of hell and into heaven. I don't care how frightened you think it is. If we can scare the hell out of you, that's a good, that's a good sermon. Was it Tozer said, if you can't get them sad, glad or mad, give up preaching. Verse 13, we, um, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now this is very interesting, we'll finish on this because we haven't got time to go into anything else here. Just wetting your appetite here. But um, you can see whether, again, the Calvinist doctrine comes in. Chosen you to salvation. I've been chosen. They are, God's chosen you before the foundation of the world. But look at this, this is really interesting. God has chosen you through what? Belief of the truth. But we are bound to give thanks always to God, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God, from the beginning, chosen you salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Belief of the truth. truth. This choosing was through two things, neither of which were present at or before the beginning. Now, turn to, we'll finish off on this, 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1 verse 2. Showing you what an idiotic doctrine Calvinism is again, because people just don't read. They take things out of context and build a little doctrine upon it. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. There you are elect. You're elect. You have no say in the matter, you're elect. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Through, through, through what? Through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So you're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ. You know what that was? You cannot get sanctified before Genesis 1.1 and you cannot have the blood of Jesus Christ before Genesis 1.1. So therefore, you are never, never in Christ before Genesis 1.1. What an idiotic doctrine. You're elect through the Spirit and you are elect through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to do something. You've got to receive it. Sanctification is not before Genesis 1.1. You're sanctified in time. You're elected in time. You're sanctified in time. Every soul that showed up after Genesis 1 was in Adam, not Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. You're elected when you decide to believe and receive. John 1, verse 12. But as many as... Um, uh, <laughs> turn now. I've, I've lost it. Shout it to me. John 1, 12. Uh, but as many as received him, received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. Sanctification is in time. So you are elect. You've got to do something to get elect. You've got to be in Christ. And you can't be in Christ before Genesis 1-1. Calvinism is an idiotic, stupid, satanic doctrine. Something that man has devised, not God. It's not in his word. It's perverted. It's perverted, like we said before, it's truth misplaced. It's heresy. They've taken a verse out of context and built something upon it. And hence why all the clever little Calvinists, all these little intellectuals that run around that try and confuse you by their intellect are saying this, you know, before time and all this stuff. You're elect through sanctification and the blood of Jesus Christ. And to get that, that's in time and you've got to do something. You've got to receive. You have a free will to choose. You can choose to reject Christ or you can choose choose to accept him. It's the two-edged sword again. So, I think that will do us. I'll uh, give you something to think about. If you've got any questions, we'll take those afterwards. Um, but, but it's a great passage to um, talk about, to study, especially in light of what we are seeing today in 2015. And we've only just entered the year. It would be fantastic if the rapture was this year. I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not date setting, of course, you know that. It's stupid to do that. But we are so close. When the Pope is putting his his throne in Jerusalem, when we are talking about this kind of stuff, starting in Rome and going to Jerusalem, something is happening big time. There's things happening, you know, today that we've never seen before. The the, the apostasy in the church, the sodomites, um, you know, seem to be ruling the land. It's, it's It's getting harder and harder for the Bible believing Christian.
And uh, God's going to pull us out, going to pull us out very, very soon at the, the rapture. It's, fu- it's funny the word translation, translate. Translate from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We're translated. We're going to be translated to heaven very, very soon. We're going to spend eternity with each other. I said to these two guys, these two guys that um, have had this bit, we've had a bit of a bust up with this week, you know. I said to think, because re- one of them is really, really having a go. I mean, mega. And I said to him, to think that we're going to spend eternity together. That's lovely, isn't it? Like this. I said, I've probably got a mansion next door to yours. He didn't respond to that. <laughs> I don't think he wants it. He'll have a word with the Lord when he gets there. <clears throat> My voice is going, I'm just getting over a cold, so I apologise for that. Amen.